So there's a lot of folks on here that have worked with Eagle before, and we thank you. We appreciate that. Um, for the uninitiated, uh, Eagle Technologies has been around for 40 years. And simply put, our goal is to create value and build long-term relationships with our customers. And we do that in a number of ways. Uh, notably, we are a heavily staffed engineering outfit. We're about three-quarter engineers, we're owned by engineers, lots of nerds walking through the hallway, if you know what I mean. Um, I think one of the things that makes us most unique is we maintain a best of breed mentality with our products. So that means that we are constantly out there evaluating new and existing technologies. We do tons of due diligence. It's actually one of the funner parts of my jobs. Um, and we're always looking for the best solutions for our customers. So, you know, another way of saying that is, is while we work with some of the big guys like HPE and Dell, we are not afraid to go outside of those portfolios if we see a solution that's more transformative and offers more value for our customers. I think we're also unique because we staff our own support group to help customers both before and after the implementation. You can call us up a week before the implementation. You can call us up five years after the implementation and we're here to help, right? It's a cradle to grave mentality that I think offers a lot of value for our customers. So, you know, in closing, we take our credibility with our customers very seriously. We spend a lot of time performing internal education to stay aware, uh, customer education to inform folks on, on how IT is transforming. We do a lot of due diligence and we, we really hope and think that all of this helps our customers make smarter IT decisions. So I thought maybe I would do a really quick history of how Eagle has evolved and how we've gotten to where we are. So if you've worked with Eagle for any amount of time, you know that we're a backup and recovery powerhouse. We've been doing this literally for decades. Uh, and while IT always evolves and we try to evolve and stay up with it, you know, immutability is a good example of that. We're having a lot of conversations around data immutability. We'll touch on some of that in this web series. Um, we believe we've been offering value in this space for a long time. So, Early on in the process at Eagle, we realized that integrating primary and secondary storage into your backup and recovery plan was key. Um, one example of that is snapshots. Uh, we always like to say the quickest way to restore a lot of data is not to have to move it at all. So we were such fan of snapshots and how they integrate with backup and recovery that early on we wrote our own software called Sand Toolkit that allowed our customers who bought storage through Eagle to restore and clone large data sets. Um, and eventually you saw vendors follow suit and start to integrate that capability into backup and recovery products. Uh, a critical part of a good business continuity and disaster recovery plan, or BCDR for short, is choosing the proper infrastructure and components. And we take a lot of pride in, in right-sizing environments for our customers. We don't run around trying to build Ferraris for everybody. We like to think that we ask the right questions, we understand what outcomes you're looking for in your business objectives, and then we tailor a BCDR solution that fits well into your expectations and needs. Uh, Really what gets us to the topic of security today is uh, a number of years ago, we started seeing a lot of pains with our customers as it relates to intrusions and most notably ransomware. So uh, a good way to put that is, is you might have a really excellent BCDR plan. You might have the ability to restore your data near instantly, but in a ransomware attack, if you restore your data, but you haven't rid of the environment of the bad actor, well, you've potentially wasted a lot of time and you're back at ground zero. So for some time, Eagle's been building out security solutions that really help complement this strategy overall of protecting your business. And while you may run into uh, a lot of folks that specialize in security, right? Or they specialize in backup and recovery, we think the fact that we can holistically look at this whole environment, we can integrate components and we can take into account not only how you can recover your data quickly, but how to create a good security posture, we think that makes us unique and we can offer a lot of value. So today's webinar is purely educational, right? Um, today we're gonna talk about the anatomy of a hack. Adam's got some great content. We're not gonna talk about any products throughout the presentation. I did wanna just pause with one more slide and talk about some of our more notable offerings that help improve security posture. So as I mentioned before, um, we've been doing backup and recovery uh, BC and DR for a really long time. Uh, it's really important when you have a good security posture to also recognize that 
you may have an infiltration, you may have to recover your data. So this is something that we've talked about a lot in the past. Early on in our process, we partnered with Arctic Wolf. We felt that truly the, the lowest hanging fruit for our customers when it came to improving their security posture was actually having endpoint detection and response. But we chose Arctic Wolf because they add more value by giving you dedicated security engineers. They help you run those millions of logs and those concerns down to the ground. And they add a lot of value around endpoint detection and response. Uh, we've done a number of webinars with these guys. We're doing one here in about a month. So if you haven't seen anything on Arctic Wolf, I'd really love to have you attend one of those webinars. Something we'll discuss a little bit more in some of these future webinars, uh, cybersecurity webinars, uh, is the fact that we've been growing out our own offerings and staffing our own talent internally. I think the best example of that right now is our black, white, and gray box penetration testing. Adam, who's going to be speaking today, actually heads up that initiative, and he uses the same tools that hackers use to infiltrate environments to find holes in our customer environments and educate them on how they can fix that. Um, like I said, we're going to be talking about that more in general later. And then finally, one of the biggest problems that we see with security is just IT talent, right? It's really hard to get specialized IT security talent. So we've worked heavily with Kadelsky Security. Uh, they are a worldwide organization that has done a fantastic job fostering talent internally. Most notably, we work with them for incident response. I believe if you ask Adam in the Q&A section, what's the likelihood of an organization, even with a fantastic security posture, of suffering through a cybersecurity breach in the next five years, he'd probably say 95%. So having a relationship with somebody that can immediately respond to that threat and help you mitigate it is really important. Why don't I head and get over and uh, introduce Adam Sabota. He is our principal cybersecurity strategist. He's been with Eagle for quite a while. He's got a background as a software engineer, really talented guy in the field of information security. I believe I mentioned earlier, he built out our penetration testing practice, and he's very good at offensive security and research. Um, as we move through this presentation, I, I would encourage you to ask questions. Uh, Anthony Schweitzer and I will, will help uh, interrupt Adam and ask those questions uh, when they're relevant, or we'll save them for the end, but please don't hesitate to throw out questions as we move through this. So with that, Adam, uh, I'll hand it over to you, sir. Awesome. Thank you, Brian, for that introduction. Um, yeah, so let's dive right into it. Um, you know, like we alluded to earlier, this is going to be a four-part cybersecurity webinar series. And part one today, we're looking at the anatomy of a hack. And we're really just going to go over some hacks that have happened in the past, some high-profile hacks, um, a, a few things to talk about that happened in 2020, and then go over, you know, really lightly what kind of tools and tactics these threat actors are using to infiltrate networks. In part two, we're really going to dive into adversary simulations. So, you know, what frameworks and tools can you use to combat these, these infiltrators on your networks? How can you simulate a cyber attack against your network? And then in part three, we're going to dive into building a better defense. So what are some basic checkboxes you can check in your organization to make sure you're doing, you know, you're, you're doing your due diligence and holding your end of the bargain up, trying to detect and track down these threats. Part four, we're going to really dive into Eagle's penetration testing offerings and explain the difference between black box, white box, and gray box testing, and you know how you can use that to help your organization build a better security posture. So to jump right into it, let's look at a legendary hack of the past. And the first hack we're going to revisit is Stuxnet. This is surely a name that many of you have heard of before. And in short, it's a story about a top secret piece of malware that was widely believed to be a joint effort between the United States and Israel designed to cause substantial damage to the nuclear program of Iran. The goal was they wanted to target these SCADA control systems present in this nuclear facility and sabotage the production of uranium. So this piece of malware was actually never supposed to be known or seen by the public eye. Um, it was eventually discovered in 2010, thought to be in development since 2005, and how it got out was kind of an accident. 
So Stuxnet targeted these PLC units that automated the mechanical process in centrifuges that are used to separate nuclear material and harvest uranium. So in the bottom right there, you can see a cutaway of a centrifuge. And what happens is there's a rotating magnetic field at the bottom that has to spin at a very precise rate in order to throw two different types of uranium atoms. The heavier one goes toward the edge, the lighter atom collects in the center, and that's how they can harvest the material they need to potentially build nuclear weapons. So the PLCs are controlling these centrifuges with high levels of precision and poor speed control will cause resonance and that will just destroy the centrifuge. So in addition to that, when Stuxnet got into the facility, it would get into these PLC systems and it would listen for a while and record what the PLC systems were outputting as normal data. It would capture that and it would start replaying that data in a loop. So all of the operators in the facility thought everything was under control and everything was operating as normal because on all their control systems, they saw normal data. In order to get into the facility and spread, uh, Stuxnet used four separate zero-day flaws in Windows to you know, infiltrate and move laterally within the facility, seek out these PLC controllers, and increase the motor frequency speed on them, causing resonance. And reportedly, they, they ultimately destroyed, I believe, one-fifth of the centrifuges before they got a handle on it and figured out that something was wrong. It ended up leaking out onto the public internet and due to the way it was built with these zero day flaws, it started spreading. So security researchers actually discovered this and started analyzing it, picking it apart. And that's really how everyone learned about it. Hey so, Adam. Yep. Sorry to break your train of thought here. You mentioned zero day a couple of times. Could you break down what a zero day vulnerability is and why it's so scary? Sure. Yeah, so a, a zero day is just a threat or an exploit that exists that the vendor doesn't know about yet, typically. So, you know, some sort of flaw in a product that nobody else knows about except the threat actor or whoever discovered the flaw. So they leverage these flaws to do incredible amounts of damage before any security researcher or threat analyst has a chance to break down what they're doing and, you know, get, get that data to the vendors and get a patch out. So, you know, the nature of a zero day, they're, they're pretty rare to come by. It, it takes, you know, a lot of talent to discover them and there's quite a high price on them. So typically you see them burned in high profile attacks or nation state sponsored attacks just due to the budget they have and the amount of resources that they can throw at discovering these zero days. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so this slide right here, I just wanted to show everybody a couple movies slash documentaries that you can watch if you want to learn more about Stuxnet. There's this great movie called Zero Days. It used to be on Netflix, but not anymore. And it, it just dives into Stuxnet in depth. And then a new documentary just came out on HBO called The Perfect Weapon that has a great section on Stuxnet, but it also goes into cyber attacks in general and how they can be used to weaponize and commit crimes you know against other nations so sort of a cyber war landscape if you're interested in that i would highly recommend both of those next what we're going to talk about is insane hacks of 2020 we're going to cover one in each webinar series here the first attack that i want to dive into is the SolarWinds attack. And we're gonna be focusing on a specific piece of that attack known as Sunspot. So in December, 2020, the industry was kind of rocked by this disclosure of a complex supply chain attack against SolarWinds, who is this leading provider of network performance monitoring tools. Um, the big one is called Orion and it's used by many Fortune 500s, a ton of governments, all these organizations across the globe. And if you guys are familiar with the SolarWinds hack, um, you may not realize that the SolarWinds hack is, is sort of a, a blanket statement to describe what are actually three to four separate attacks that you know, all combined to make, to make this thing happen. And, you know, I'm going to talk, I'm going to refer to them as stages. So stage one of this attack is what we're going to call sunspot. And that was the actual supply chain compromise 
that allowed them to compromise the build machines at SolarWinds and inject their malicious code into the Orion software before it was signed and put on servers to be shipped out as updates to all of their clients. Another stage you may have heard about is Sunburst, which is the actual piece of malware that got shipped out to SolarWinds customers, leading to further compromise. And then the third stage you may hear about is, is referred to as teardrop or raindrop. And this is the loader or the beacon that's used to move laterally and, and compromise all of these machines or exfiltrate data after the malware has been loaded. So personally, I think one of the most impressive pieces of this attack was actually Sunspot stage one. And it didn't get a lot of media coverage early on because SolarWinds was still kind of scrambling to figure out how they were compromised and how they managed to ship this update out. So we'll dive into that. And what we're gonna be looking at is Sunspot would run in the background on all of SolarWinds build VMs. So they use VMware and they had all these VMs and every time they made a change to their code, they would update you know, their source code repository, push it out, and these VMs would take the code changes and they would run it through the build process and output the binaries that were then digitally signed with the SolarWinds certificate and shipped out to customers. So Sunspot got on these build VMs, it ran in the background using a name called task host service to kind of fly under the radar, right? And it would monitor for another process to run on those build VMs and that's known as msbuild.exe. So if any of you are familiar with Visual Studio or anything, you know, msbuild is the process that takes the code and compiles it to a runnable, executable format. So it would constantly monitor for this, and as soon as it saw MS Build was running on a build VM, it would check and see what it was building. And if it was building the SolarWinds Orion project, it would on the fly dynamically inject its malicious code into the inventory manager file. And it would let the build complete, and then it would clean up all traces. So, What's, what's really unique about this and, and scary is, you know, this type of supply chain compromise is worrisome because it avoids any version control conflicts or detection on disk by the developers. The developers aren't seeing any code files changing, you know, they're not leaving their malicious code behind. So the developers are clueless. And, you know, if you're not monitoring or really going back through and looking through your built binaries, which I really don't think anyone's doing, um, you're just not going to catch an attack like this. It was really incredible. And they managed to spend a lot of time in the SolarWinds environment testing this before they deployed it. So these threat actors got into SolarWinds on September 4th, 2019, and they started, you know, figuring out how can we inject code? How can we compromise SolarWinds? And by February 2020, they had their malware ready to go and they needed to figure out a way to distribute it. So they were working on Sunspot and, you know, that sat on these VMs for three months before they removed the Sunspot injector. So, you know, there was plenty of time for this malware to go out to go through the supply chain, go out and be distributed to all of these customers. And this attack is, is just really interesting to look at because an attack of this caliber is very difficult to detect. And we may dive more into the other stages of this attack in a later webinar, or you know, maybe we can discuss it with you, you know, otherwise, but they even went as far as to emulate and piggyback off of the SolarWinds Orion improvement protocol, which is how Orion reports suggestions back to SolarWinds. And they kind of hijacked and manipulated the, the data to smuggle and exfiltrate data from these environments. So jumping right back into it, let's talk a little bit about threat classification and identification. So in order to understand how the bad guys act, we have to be able to classify their behavior. Um, you guys may have heard of the terms MITRE ATT&CK framework or cyber kill chain. And the MITRE ATT&CK matrix is, is the set of techniques that are used by adversaries to accomplish a specific objective. So these objectives are categorized as tactics within the matrix, and they're presented kind of linearly from the point of reconnaissance all the way until you know, the attacker's accomplishing his goal or exfiltrating data. So you can think of it as a set of 
identifiers or classifications for a behavior found within an adversary's toolkit. And as, as you know, the more adversary behaviors that you can classify and uniquely identify, we can generate these digital fingerprints, so to speak, and actually identify and track these adversary groups and threats just based on their behavior alone. So Lockheed Martin has created this framework called Cyber Kill Chain. And it's a really broad picture of what a traditional adversary attack flow looks like. So we see a basic outline of the typical attack traje trajectory. Um, it begins with the recon phase. So during this phase, attackers are collecting as much information about your organization that they can find on the public internet. They're gonna be combing through all of your external assets, open ports, services you have exposed. They're gonna look at the versions of the software that's running if they have any known vulnerabilities. And then they're gonna go in and look at all of your employees, You know, get your employee names, email addresses off of sites like LinkedIn, it's pretty trivial. And then you're gonna take everything you gathered on the employees and look and see, hey, have they been a member of another website that was the victim of a data breach? Are they reusing a credential that leaked in the past at their organization today, et cetera, et cetera. So you're really building this portfolio of in-depth information, everything you can find, and you're going to take it and, and try to weaponize it. So typically in the form of a targeted phishing attack against specific employees, sometimes it's already after you've compromised some internal infrastructure or accounts that let you send emails internally without raising any red flags. And from there, you're going to move on to the exploitation phase. After an employee falls for one of these attacks, or you know, once the organization's internal network is breached, the, the threat actor is going to look at the installation and command and control se section where they're going to take malicious software, try to deploy it on as many of your internal assets as they can, or whichever assets they need to, to accomplish their goal. Um, use that information to move laterally, collect credentials, Windows password hashes, information about your Windows Active Directory domain, group privileges, you know, kind of build this map of what users do I need to compromise to get whatever group permissions I need in Active Directory to get said data. And after gathering all this information necessary and moving through the internal network, they're going to, you know, go to the actions on objectives phase, for a ransomware attack, this is typically a phase where, you know, you've identified the backup servers in the environment, you can do damage to their backups, and you've identified where the really critical data is in the environment, and that's where you pull the trigger on the ransomware, start the encryption process, and exfiltrate any data that you may need. So the cyber kill chain is great to get, you know, a really bird's eye view of a typical attack flow that you're going to see. And when you couple that with something like the MITRE ATT&CK framework, I apologize for all the text on this slide. You're, you're not really meant to read it all, but it, it just kind of shows you, you know, if you look at, at the top column here, for example, reconnaissance, you know, that consists of active scanning, victim identity information, closed sources, phishing information. So we're, we're getting very granular and we're taking that cyber kill chain and we're breaking it out into a ton of techniques and sub techniques. And then when you look at actual behaviors of attacks and you map them to these techniques, you can start identifying attackers. And that kind of bleeds into the next section, which we won't spend too much time on, but I wanted to bring up this acronym called APT groups, which stand for Advanced Persistent Threats. And these are typically your nation state sponsored actors. And, you know, unlike most cyber criminals, these guys will pursue their objectives over many months or years. So heavy emphasis on the term persistence in the acronym. And when, when we take that MITRE ATT&CK technique, we can map the behavior and map back, you know, to uh, an app group that may be attributed to a, a specific nation state. So here's an example of an apt group called app 29 they typically are just named apt with a bunch of numbers after them and you know they've they've been able to track this particular group to three different types of malware based on behavioral analysis alone um, suspected attribution is the russian government we can't you know no way to prove that that's just based on metadata and behavior 
But th that's what these companies are doing now. They're, they're collecting all this behavioral data. So within your own environments, it's really important to have a way to aggregate logs or collect some of this data. So if you ever are the victim of a, of a big attack, we can use that data for forensical analysis and potentially map back the behaviors to some known threat actor. And that really helps with remediation and just understanding what happened in your environment. And we're gonna talk a little bit about phishing attacks and why they're so effective and easy to fall for. So common phishing attacks, right? Email, one of the most common attack vectors. It's easy to get your employee emails. A lot of companies put them up on an employee directory to begin with. If not, there's LinkedIn, social media, you know, really trivial for people to harvest those emails. And they're going to look at the job titles, try to figure out what those employees do at work, what their responsibilities are, and use that information to craft some convincing message that, you know, they're probably likely to click on. The way that the malicious software makes it into the environment is typically through malicious document files. And, you know, these are your typical Word and Excel files with macros in them. Um, it's the delivery method used by Emotet, which was one of the most notorious and popular malware loaders for many, many years, which was just recently shut down by law, you know, collaborative move between law enforcement internationally. So these are still very real threats, you know, don't, don't activate macros if you get an email message. Keep a really close eye on that. They're going to target current events. So with COVID, you know, COVID-related attacks are very common. It's the peak of the public news cycle scare. Everybody's, you know, has their eyes on that. You send some phishing email like, oh, we have a new company-wide COVID policy, or you know, you need to sign this and or look at this ASAP. That really, you know, got a lot of people to click. And they're also going to look at websites that people in your company use, whether that's some CRM package, maybe you have Office 365, a company login portal. They will look at that portal, clone the web page, and put it up on a fake domain, blast it out on an email. And if it's convincing enough and your employees aren't looking at the URLs in the browser after they click it, they'll see that page and it looks just like the page they, they know and love to log into every day. So, you know, attacks like that are really dangerous and they're very simple, but, but very effective. And it all depends on how much information you can gather about that organization and their employees in order to figure out, you know, what's the easiest way I could manipulate them into clicking. So macro attack vectors, again, these have been around forever. I don't think it's news to anybody. You know, you'll open a Word doc that says something like this. This document was created in an online version of Word. You need to enable editing or enable content. And employees click that button and it's pretty much game over. If you don't have an AV or EDR running that can detect that threat, it's gonna download a payload, load malicious software on their machine, and you know they're not even gonna know about it. So this is actually really trivial to get around and prevent. And you can Google this thing called Microsoft Security Baselines if you're not already familiar with it. Microsoft releases these collection of pre-made group policy templates that are already configured for best practice Windows security settings. And one of these settings is that macros are disabled on workstations at a group policy level. So even if your employees wanted to use a macro, they can't use it. And you know, there's a security compliance toolkit that Microsoft offers too that's going to look at your existing GPO settings and highlight some of the concerns that may be enabling these attackers to compromise your environment. It's important to train your employees on phishing, and this is really hard to do. There's a lot of training services out there for phishing attacks, and one of the most impressive ones that I've seen is called No Before. And it's, it's sort of a, a combination of a training suite and a phishing attack simulation suite. So you can put your employees in there, they can take classes, watch videos, answer questions. Um, we can get them trained on phishing, and then you can actually send them phishing emails based on hundreds of templates that target everything from current events to specific job responsibilities. And those get sent out to your employees on whatever interval you would like. And if they fall for one of those attacks, you know, that you're, you're notified and you can work on helping them understand or training them around that attack. Proofpoint is another one that I, I don't think a lot of people 
know about phishing wise, um, it's very popular, you know, as an email anti-spam filtering system, extremely popular, but they also have sort of a mini version of know before implemented as far as the attack simulation goes. Um, you can use Proofpoint to take these templates and send out phishing attacks to your employees as well. And it does some similar stuff. So if you already use Proofpoint or you're interested in Proofpoint for email anti-spam filtering, um, that's a great addition, additional offering that they have. And they're really starting to flesh that out. And I think it's gonna grow into being a pretty mature offering. And Adam, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that that's a solution that Eagle offers. Yeah, for sure. We offer it, we use it internally. And I, I've been really impressed with that. We've been through several email security and anti-spam services. And I think this one's the, the real winner right now for us. So we are going to talk a little bit about ransomware. And, you know, during the first half of 2020, I think I read somewhere there was a 109% rise in ransomware activity. And you know what really happened is all these IT departments are struggling to convert their businesses to allow the remote access required for their employees who are suddenly finding themselves working from home um, due to COVID. You know, they're not prepared for the increased threat and in cyber attacks. That, you know, not familiar with how to monitor and detect them. So just like COVID has accelerated the tech industry when it comes to software that promotes remote working, it's accelerated the development and deployment of certain types of cyber threats to take advantage of that. Typical ransomware works, you know, you're hit by some type of phishing attack, an employee opens an attachment that runs a malware loader like Emotet, that's gonna run another payload and load the ransomware on your machine. Ransomware typically runs on a low privileged user machine, pings back home, and threat actors are going to get on that local machine and start investigating it. So they'll look at that user's permissions within AD, they'll dump their Windows password hashes from memory and start to poke around laterally on the network. Like, hey, now that I have this user, what else can he access on his company's network? Maybe it's a file share, maybe it's another machine. You know, maybe he's a local admin on a web server that has this data on it that I want. So they're gonna really dig through AD and try to move laterally and, you know, inflict the most possible damage that they can. When ransomware was, was newer, you know, we would see ransomware attackers generating keys, unique keys, and encrypting entire organizations or entire machines, sometimes they would reuse the keys. So when these threat researchers shut down the ransomware, um, sometimes the keys were leaked. And then these companies could decrypt their data without paying the ransom. You really don't see that often today. You know, these guys have really Got, they've gotten really good at it. They generate unique private keys for each individual file on the machine. So the odds of you being able to decrypt that data without paying the ransom or somehow negotiating a way to get those keys from the threat actor is virtually impossible. And you'll see that more with high profile attacks that are targeting organizations. And Adam, didn't I read early on that some researchers were even able to intercept the keys as they pass through the network? Yeah, sometimes because they, they would send the private key with the public key, you know, over the wire. Um, you know, now you'll see they're, they're generating the private keys server side and they're just sending the public keys to the ransomware encryptors, the malicious software. So like, yeah, they've really tightened it up and it's pretty hard, you know, if you get hit by ransomware, your organization gets hit by ransomware, it's really low odds that you're gonna be able to achieve a decryption key without somehow negotiate, negotiating with the actor. Um, you know, the actor typically sells these private keys and software bundles that they call decryptors and that's gonna automate the decryption process. I wanted to talk really quick about the Garmin attack that happened last year. Um, they got hit by a piece of ransomware called Wasted Locker. Um, this was likely a very targeted attack. It probably resulted in days or weeks of internal network reconnaissance. These actors were combing through Garmin's backups, you know, trying to see if 
if they could encrypt the backups or just render them not conducive to restore. If, if it takes too long and there's too much business profit loss and reputation hit, sometimes it's cheaper for these companies just to pay the ransom, especially if they have cybersecurity um, insurance already. So this particular ransom was rumored to be about $10 million. And we only got that number from leaked cell phone screenshots of employees taking pictures of what they were seeing on their monitor and kind of leaking that out to press websites like Bleeping Computer, or posting them on the public internet. So Garmin was down for several days, um, many of their services. And after that went on for a few days, we, we you know, came out in the press that Garmin obtained the decryptor. And it's highly likely that they paid a ransom. They worked with companies such as Emisoft, which helps take these decryptors that you will purchase from threat actors and optimize them to make them faster and more efficient to help you recover from that downtime quicker. Um, they also worked with a company called Coveware, which is a well-known ransomware negotiation service firm. So very highly likely that they paid a ransom. Was it $10 million? We don't know. You know, there could have been some negotiations involved. But this was interesting because it also kind of leaked out what Garmin was doing to, to solve the problem. So they put together this restoration package that they started pushing out to all of their IT machines. And that included the decryptor, which they got from the threat actor. Um, it included Nessus Agent, which is this vulnerability scanner software and a Sentinel installer, which is likely the Sentinel-1 EDR agent, which we're going to talk a lot more about EDR in part three, and we will have a couple slides on that later. And then it looks like they were looking at Malwarebytes and point security for business. So, you know, they're shipping out the decryptor to recover and then really loading all of the security-related software on these endpoints to try to prevent this from happening again. So cruising along, um, we're going to touch a little bit on defense. I, you know, I always say fighting you know, cybersecurity defense is you're kind of fighting a losing battle, but there's a lot you can do to stay on top of the game and really make your remediation or potential remediation a lot less of a headache. So an important thing to realize, you know, a lot of organizations today who are building these, these modern security defenses are looking at some combination of SIMS or antivirus and EDR, which we'll talk about in a second. And defense really isn't just these tool sets and software, it's keeping up to date on industry news, you know, the latest threats, and more important than anything, just patching your assets, patching your operating systems, and any sort of continuous training and security control validation you can do with your employees, phishing training is really important. It's just a lot of sharing of knowledge. So in order to break down what a SIM is, SIM stands for Security Information and Event System. And you can think of it as a full text search optimized database, typically something built upon Elasticsearch, if you guys have heard of that. And it's just really good at ingesting all of this textual log data and then storing it in a way that lets you leverage this awesome query language in the ELK stack to identify and pull out behaviors that are going on within your environment. Um, they're gonna collect network and event system logs from all of your organization's endpoints. This is usually some type of agent you install, or if you're using syslog or some other type of collector, they can leach into that and pull that data. There's a high focus on security relevant logging data. So they're looking at things like network, collect, network connections, processes that are created, processes that try to inject code into other processes, or they set themselves to automatically start with Windows anything like that that's a little suspect. And they're gonna actually use that MITRE ATT&CK technique mapping framework that we talked about. So they're gonna come through your log files, pull out things like code injection, automatic start, classify that within the MITRE ATT&CK framework and sort of build this, this graph and timeline for you to see malicious behavior going on in your environment. And you can kind of follow it in the order that it happened. You can use that visibility to see how it spread through your environment, what machines it infected first and where it ultimately went to. So a SIM is, a SIM is extremely important for forensical analysis and remediation if you have an incident response event where you've been hit by an attack, you need to know the scope of that attack, what kind of damage it did and what machines it's on. So a SIM really gives you that insight that you're not gonna get with any other type of product. 
And this is kind of what a modern sim looks like. Um, they all look very different. This is an example of the elastic security sim. So you can create and track these timelines of events that correlate to singular security incidents in your environment. Um, through the centralized location that aggregates all your security logging data, it, it can be really challenging to manage a SIM. You know, it's a full-time job for some people, depending on the size of your organization and, and how much you have going on. It can be really difficult. So we won't talk about it much today, but I think that's really where our partnership with Arctic Wolf shines. They're able to take all this data into their SIM that they're collecting from your endpoints and comb through it, remove a ton of the noise and false positives, and just show you, you know, this is potential malicious behavior that's occurring. You know, this process kicked off, injected some code, spread to this machine, stuff like that. So you, you get a nice visualization and, and better understanding of what's going on in your, your environment from a security incident perspective. To dive into EDR really quickly, um, EDR stands for Endpoint Detection and Response, and sometimes people will call it next generation antivirus. There's really a lot of buzzwords and ways to describe it, but you know, you can really just think of EDR as extremely proactive. It's, it's only really looking at behavior. It doesn't look at appearances. Antivirus is traditionally reactive. You know, antivirus learns about threats after vendors have already detected and analyzed and published their signatures. So AV does try to be proactive proactive in some ways through heuristics, but these are typically, you know, rendered ineffective or unreliable. Some antivirus products use real-time scanning to try to be proactive, but they're really not looking at the full behavioral analysis of a process and, and really tracking what it does. So EDR runs in the background. It looks you know, continuously for creation of any new processes on your system. And once they're spawned, it typically tries to load a DLL file into that process that lets it hook a lot of user mode API functions. So it puts hooks on all these functions. And then whenever the process calls these functions, it can analyze its behavior, figure out what, what other files it's, you know, writing. Is it writing a file, dropping a file, communicating over the network? And it takes that data, sends it back to, you know, typically some sort of centralized artificial intelligence platform that runs in the cloud and it analyzes it on the fly. And if it detects that it's potential malicious behavior, the EDR agent already has the hooks in the process, it can typically quarantine or, or shut that down. So when you look at this behavior and you couple that with AI and how we're training these, these neural network models in the cloud, EDR is the only, only type of agent you can deploy in your environment that's actually capable of stopping a zero day attack based on behavior alone. Um, you know, think of antivirus uh, like similar to that of vaccines, right? We can only create vaccines for diseases we know about. Antivirus traditionally only detects signatures it's aware of to be malicious, whereas EDR you're looking at behavior of mass file access, mass file handles, overwrites. It's not signature based or hash based. It's just, you know, it's, it's really, really a great way to look at behavior alone. And antivirus kind of has this stereotype that it's slow and clunky and, and slows things down. And, you know, it's doing a lot of processing on the local clients. It's reading files, comparing them to a hash table of signatures, monitoring some heuristic behavior, whereas EDR agents are typically marketed and for the most part are more lightweight than antivirus because they're offloading a lot of that analysis to an AI model in the cloud. So, you know, they're just sending metadata and telemetry and the AI model in the cloud is crunching all the numbers. And then when it balks back with something, it's, it's going to take an action. So EDR injects in the process, I got a little ahead of myself with these, sorry. But yeah, the behavior is monitored in real time on the back end. So I hope that kind of helps explain, you know, in an overview, what I view the main difference between EDR and AV to be. And at the bottom, you'll see some logos of some of the most popular EDR products that you may have heard of. So CrowdStrike is really, you know, probably the most popular right now. They're really taking great strides. Um, their product Falcon Spy is 
is pretty incredible with what it can do. Sentinel One is right up there with them. And you know, then we have we see companies using malware by malware bytes, checkpoint, and Sophos Intercept as well. And there's really tons of these. Like pretty much every traditional antivirus vendor is getting on the EDR train. So they're gonna offer some sort of this product. So so Adam, if I can ask you a quick question, does this replace antivirus or does it augment? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a challenge, right? I, I don't, it doesn't replace antivirus all the time. Um, you often see people run antivirus, um, you know, in tandem with an EDR agent. There's some EDR that can behave as a traditional antivirus where they do look at signatures, but I, I think a lot of people run both. They run an AV and an EDR. Um, Personally, I, I don't know that I would feel the need to run both if, if it was my environment. I think EDR has really evolved to a point where just by looking at the behavior with the, the classification techniques that we have and how powerful AI is getting, um, you know, I don't think it's as much of a necessity, but you certainly see them run, you know, in tandem a lot. At a bare minimum, would it be a good idea to run something free like Defender and then spend those dollars on EDR or MDR? That's not a bad idea. I mean, yeah, you know, you get Defender for free anyway. So if, you know, Microsoft Windows Defender does have some performance hit on like real-time file I.O. and stuff, but, it, you know, if that's not a problem for your organization, why not run both? All right, so kind of wrapping things up today, um, you got a little bit of a taste of some of the topics that we're gonna go into deep detail in in the other parts of the webinars. Um, but to wrap it up, you know, what can you do today or what can you guys start thinking about today from what you've learned and take that back to your organization and, and consider implementing some of this stuff. So, you know, you wanna have a way to monitor your endpoints. Um, oftentimes today that's done through a SIM or an EDR. Um, at the bare minimum, you know, think of some way you can collect logging and behavioral analysis on some of your endpoints. Make sure that you have an inventory of these endpoints and you can use that to control and, and make sure that they're all being patched regularly. Data security is a massive part of it. Um, if you get hit, you know, as something you're, you're probably going to have to start looking at restoring from backups if that's conducive to your business plan. So have some secured type of offsite backup or backups on some sort of immutable storage and look at having or testing a DR or an IR plan to make sure that you could meet these response times. Um, I think a lot of people deploy backups and manage backups, but don't often consider what it would look like to actually go through a full restore in the case of a disaster or, a disaster or incident. You know, so it's important to keep that in mind too. Um, something we're gonna talk a lot more about in part three is the ideas of zero trust. And if you're not familiar with that, it's sort of just the idea that you don't trust anything, any service or endpoint without explicit authentication. You know, we see for, for the long time, the norm was, you know, everything on our company's internal LAN or internal network is for the most part trusted once you're on the LAN. Like I can access a local printer, maybe there's a file share and I'm just assume that it's trusted because I'm on the LAN. So zero, zero trust is taking that idea and making sure you're putting some sort of authentication in front of all of it. And that's typically going to incorporate multi-factor authentication as a forced piece of it. So if you guys are you know, already adopting cloud services like Office 365 or using Azure AD, you're seeing use of this model, even if you aren't aware of what it does. Um, but that's the way you know, things are going in the cloud. You can't access anything in the cloud without some sort of authentication at every, you know, every sort of piece and multi-factor authentication. There's a lot of free services. There's one called Have I Been Pwned, where you can go and sign up for this and it will look through all of the databases of known credential link leaks from compromised websites and let you know if anyone in your organization with your company's domain 
has been a part of a recent data breach. And so it's completely free. And you can use stuff like that to notify your employees and make sure that they're changing their passwords or, you know, if they got breached on another site that they're not reusing that password in your organization. And finally, you know, talk to Eagle. We, we have the playbooks and partnerships and talent to tackle a lot of these cybersecurity defense problems. So through the partnership with Arctic Wolf, we can talk about managed SIMS, um, incident response with Kadelsky, dealing with forensics and cleaning up malicious infections. And then, you know, how, how is my security posture today? How safe am I against an attacker that's using some of these tactics we talked about? And that's where penetration testing really comes in. So you can kind of customize some type of adversary threat simulation against your environment. 